In the lead-up to the Dominion War, one of the issues between the Federation and the Dominion was a lack of trust, and I would say that even helped cause the war itself. On that topic, give me a second. Hey, Kowalski, why don't you come out here? I just want to talk about Discovery, the reason you came here in the first place. Do you still have the gun? No. I'm good. Come on, dude. It's just for protection. I gotta, you know, make sure that Toss fans don't come after me. You are really bad at lying. <sighs> All right. Looks like we're gonna be here a second, so let's just get into it. What's interesting about DS9's The Ship is more about when it happens in the timeline of the entire series than what actually occurs. This episode is directly after Apocalypse Rising and arguably the quote unquote Dominion Cold War is beginning to heat up. Anytime before this, and I think we may have actually seen a Starfleet, we may have seen a Captain Sisko, more willing to negotiate. The episode begins with Cisco, Dax, O'Brien, and several others doing a geological survey of a planet in the Gamma Quadrant. And of course, having the man who has in-depth knowledge of the Bajoran sector and its defenses, as well as the chief engineer of the frontline defense against the Dominion invasion doing all of this work, is just all kinds of big brain smart. Though, they do have Dax, which makes sense, she's the science officer. They actually have other personnel as well, which is a nice change of pace. While on the survey, a ship crash lands onto the planet. Though Starfleet has known of the Dominion for two or three years, been in battle with their warships, and identified them previously, the runabout would have no idea what this ship is when it hits the planet. The away team investigates to find that it's actually a Jem'Hadar warship. The runabout, having the same big brains we saw before, don't go on red alert or keep active scans open for other Jem'Hadar ships. To be fair, the away team doesn't do anything to prepare for other ships either. After investigation, the away team determines that the ship had an internal malfunction with its inertial dampeners failing. When the ship accelerated, the bodies were thrown into a bulkhead, shattering all of the bones. This is, again, a horrifying idea to think of when living in that universe. Though, we have seen that inertial dampeners go down before and this not happen, showing how powerful plot armor can actually be. If only the Dominion had had it. Also, another question. What is holding the Jem'Hadar to the floor? We know that the Starfleet crew are walking on the ceiling, so why are the Jem'Hadar just hanging there? Do they have magnetic boots, or are they wearing seatbelts? I mean, there are no seats, so it's just confusing. One last thing I'm going to briefly mention and then won't discuss after. I intend to start doing a series on the cinematography of the shows since that seemed to be a big hit when I tried it a while back. But just for here, I want to say I really appreciate the angles used. The camera often uses a Dutch or canted angle and it gives a feeling of otherworldliness. It makes where the Starfleet crew is dangerous and unknown to the audience. But it also simulates that the ship is at an angle, so they hit two birds with one stone. It's really well done. We do get more information on how advanced Dominion technology is here. O'Brien determines that the ship was able to withstand a crash while going at a high velocity. It doesn't utilize the same type of power systems that the Federation does, and it has two headsets that are able to see outside of the ship like a view screen, but only utilized by the Vorta and the Jem'Hadar first. No one else gets to see what's happening, of course. Sisko orders the runabout to contact the station, and the Defiant is dispatched to help get the Jem'Hadar ship out of the rock and off the planet. This is so that they can get it back to Deep Space Nine. This is the intelligence find of the decade. However, before it can arrive, another Jem'Hadar warship enters into space. Because long-range scanners aren't a thing now, I guess, the runabout is blown to hell and back by the Jem'Hadar. Troops transport onto the planet and attack the away team. The Starfleet personnel take casualties with one of the crewmen, Munez, getting hit in the chest, which he apparently can take like a champ with only a soft grunt when he's hit. This is further impressive when you consider main cast members have taken hits and been critically wounded. The Starfleet personnel retreat into the Dominion ship and pull back to their command center. One Starfleet officer is hit, as I mentioned, Munez, and isn't doing so well. The Vorta contacts the captain and wants to discuss what is occurring. And then, we have the meeting, and hello, female Vorta. I mean, wow. Let me say, this is how you take over the Alpha Quadrant. I'm, I'm just saying, it's a better tactic than guns. She flatters Sisko, who isn't having any of it, and the Vorta demands to have their ship back, and Sisko refuses. Now let's stop and talk a moment about what happens here. Sisko refuses to give the ship back, and that is exceptionally on Starfleet and not becoming of an officer. Now before people get upset, yeah, yeah, I know, you're about to give me a 21st century perspective and why you think it's fine, and you may be right. 
But we're not talking about a person on Earth in the 21st century. We're talking about a Starfleet officer in the 24th century. This is not how the Starfleet of the pacifistic era would act. But then again, we're not really in the pacifistic era completely anymore, are we? Cisco wants the ship for the intelligence it can provide to Starfleet, and he's willing to betray the prior ethos of Starfleet to get it. Hell, Starfleet Command gives him a medal for it. He is also going to be willingly sacrificing a life of another officer to get this. In story writing, the quote-unquote good guys are generally the people that change. The bad guys don't. In this episode, we see the good guys changing, but whether that's good or bad is up to someone's perception. Another fun note, the Vorta offers Cisco food and she says it's not poisonous. He retorts that it's not poisonous to the Vorta at least. We learn later that Vorta are created with the ability to resist most poisons. Though I don't think she was lying to him, it's a fun little piece of continuity and shows the Vorta could be deceptive. The talks are useless, however, as it's all a ploy to get a Jem'Hadar in the craft by the Dominion. I guess Starfleet officers don't keep their tricorders active to detect transporters. I'd just be stupid. While the Jem'Hadar is on board undetected, the Vorta tries multiple tactics to sway Sisko. Again, trying to appeal to his ego, then trying to offer food, and finally acting as if she is a new Vorta, coming off even more submissive that it's all her fault, wanting to just take them home and have this all end peaceably. The Jem'Hadar that boarded the ship is killed, but not before his mission is successful. The talks break down at this point and Cisco returns to the ship. The sad thing is, both sides could have stopped it here, but now, after everything that has happened, that trust is gone. Trust. Trust was the main issue both sides had in this and would have for the rest of the series. Last chance, Walski. Come out. I'm not the one with the gun. All right, man. Well, hey, well, that's your choice. You know this is illegal, right? Yeah, they're gonna have to find the remains for that to be an issue, brother. See you guys. Wait, what? With the Dominion now showing that they can't be trusted, the Starfleet personnel move to get the power activated. The Jemadar patrol above while Cisco and co. work as hard as they can below. An interesting piece Dax discovers is the ship itself has different systems and rooms than the normal ones they've encountered. Again, showing they do have scans of these ships, by the by. We know that a Changeling is on board ultimately, and this may actually show that Changeling ships are more command and control. They have different systems than your regular Dominion warships. Cisco and the female have another meeting, the Vorta coming by herself. She seems desperate, needing to get into the ship. She says there is something she wants and asks if her and her men can come in to get it. Cisco offers to go get it for her and she declines. The Vorta ultimately just wants to retrieve what they came for, offering the ship and Cisco feels it will endanger his crew. With an impasse met, the Vorta female leaves and they begin to fire around the ship. Cisco and crew know they are alive because of something on that vessel. The shelling is meant to rattle them. The crew begins looking and finds odds and ends that may or may not be what they're looking for, but nothing definitive, and they do start to become rattled. Even though they know the Dominion won't target the ship specifically, they begin fighting amongst themselves. In the end, it was a changeling that the Dominion had been looking for the entire time. The changeling ultimately dies after hiding for so long, and the Vorta beams into the ship, showing she had the ability the whole time. The Jem'Hadar had killed themselves, failing to save the changeling, and the Vorta gathers some of the remains. The Defiant finally arrives, and they are able to get the vessel back to the station. Before this event, we wouldn't see Starfleet ships able to withstand many hits from the Dominion, but after, even Deep Space Nine is able to keep up under Dominion assault. I'll be discussing the casualties of this and war in another video, but at the end of the day, they discuss the five lives that were lost, or at least the five lives they care about, and how they would trade them again for what they got. But it doesn't make it any easier. This is going to be an interesting and consistent theme we see going forward.